Thank you. To Dawar Bashir Zmantamoti, usually when I come to Israel, I tell people that I'm going to speak in English because my English is, is you know, much better than my Hebrew. Uh, the problem with coming to the Technion is your English is actually much better than my English. Uh, and, and the next time I come, please make sure that I don't have to follow Rami because that, that, that was an absolutely impossible act to follow. It might be the best talk I've heard in a year. And I, I spend at least six weeks a year in conferences on mobile health, the future of IT and healthcare. And in the last day, I've probably heard more promising ideas, more exciting ideas uh, than I've heard in the last six weeks of industry conferences that I've sat through. So really thank you for inviting me. Uh, we have a real challenge. And it's, it's very silly for me to come to Israel and talk about the crisis that we have uh, in healthcare, because if you look at the chart, uh, the United States is spending a lot more, in fact, twice as much per person uh, for healthcare as the state of Israel, uh, and we're actually uh, getting less for it in terms of just about every measure of outcome, uh, in, including life. So for me to come here and talk about what we ought to do in healthcare uh, would seem silly, uh, given how much uh, is being done right here. Uh, and being done wrong where I live. Uh, but the bottom line is that no matter what kind of health reform we install, if all we're doing is giving people more access to a product that costs too much and doesn't work well enough, uh, it's not going to succeed. And at the end of the day, there are only three options in healthcare. Uh, one is we can deny care to consumers, say, well, you're over 70, you don't qualify for a pacemaker anymore, but we'll make you comfortable while you die. And there are countries that do that, and do that systematically and consider it equitable. Uh, we can reduce what we pay doctors and hospitals, but sooner or later the, the doctors uh, quit and go into other businesses, and the hospitals close, and we're seeing that happen uh, in the United States, and we see that happen in some other countries. Or we can figure out how to use technology to reduce the cost of health care so that we get the value that we need for our money and we actually reduce the need for expensive care. The basic problem is that the 2,000-year-old model of disease and health care is broken. It used to be that you went to the doctor, you told him what the problem was, and he either looked at the entrails of a chicken or he said a magic incantation or he actually listened uh, to your story. He diagnosed your disease, he gave you a treatment, you either lived or you died, and that was the end of the encounter. And that worked well, or that's what we did for acute illness. It actually was only until about the turn of the 20th century that your chance of being helped by your doctor was greater than your chance of being harmed by your doctor. But once we invented antibiotics, the balance shifted, and for 100 years we did very well by treating acute illness. The problem we have now is that 70% of healthcare spending is on chronic illness, and that model just doesn't work. That model of, you know, see me in six months and we'll see what's going on doesn't work. So we've had four phases of using information technology and new technology to try to transform healthcare. And the first phase was using available data, mostly from insurance claims, as low hanging fruit for uh, improving care. Uh, the second phase, introducing electronic medical records and attempting to use the content of electronic medical records to reduce medical error. We're really right in that third phase right now, using smart devices to engage the patient. And the one I'd like to point to, the phase that I see coming, and the phase that people here at Technion are starting to talk about, but I don't know anybody else who's really talking about it, is where big data meets big imagination. So it all started in healthcare. Uh, 1988, 89, uh, I was there, but my dear friend Henry Krakauer, is a Chronola Bracha, made sure to keep me off the paper, where we uh, took the Medicare claims data, which were only supposed to be used for paying bills, and actually used them to show that there were big differences in the likelihood that you would be alive six months after you went to different U.S. hospitals for the same procedure. You had you know, a three times greater chance of surviving open heart surgery if you went to Johns Hopkins than if you went to several of the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation's hospitals. And there was an earthquake in the United States. In fact, Henry's the only uh, 
the only uh, senior medical officer in the U.S. Public Health Service who was both fired preemptorily by a Medicare administrator and then decorated for life by the Surgeon General of the United States for having done this work. Uh, and uh, the reason I put that picture there is because we had to pass 30 reels of computer tape for each analysis we did, and the hardest part of doing the research was getting the tape operators to change the tapes in the middle of the night. But it was the beginning of using big data. Uh, I was involved in starting a company, Active Health Management, where we showed that if you just identify the common medical errors that are found right in the claims data, you can reduce hospitalization 6%. And now every insurance company in the United States does that. So you know, that was an era that took us a little bit of the way there. But then the next phase was to get the paper out of the system, to really move to electronic medical records. And again, it's silly for me to come to Israel uh, and talk about electronic medical records in this way because on the day that President Bush finally signed the order taking the entire country away from paper to electronic records over 10 years, uh, the state of Israel already had 100% deployment of outpatient medical records across all four kupot. So this is a good place to come and learn about the future. Uh, but, but that second phase of using electronic medical records in order to prevent the stupid drug errors that occur every day is you know, well in place. Because if you just put an armband around the patient with a barcode, put an armband on the pill, you take the likelihood of the wrong pill getting into the wrong mouth from about 20% down to less than one in 10,000. And now every US hospital is in the process of doing it. It also is critical for driving compliance with guidelines. And this is a slide that some friends at Maccabi gave me a number of years ago showing how you know, just putting electronic medical records in place enables you to massively improve compliance, in this case with cholesterol reduction. But any disease process you want to track can be done through electronic medical records as long as it's something that is knowable from the pharmacy data and from the medical record. Well, that only takes you so far. Because the next big leap, the one that we're in the middle of right now, is the one called, how do we engage the patient? How do we engage the patient in managing a chronic illness? Because the good news is that we can reduce or eliminate nearly all complications of the major chronic illnesses that we face. The bad news is the patient is the one who has to do the work. And saying to the patient, here's what you do and come back in six months, and tell me how it's going just isn't going to succeed. It doesn't succeed ever. So here's a, a beautiful study that was done uh, by a man named Soko, published in Medical Care, where he looked at prescription non-adherence to uh, diabetes medication across hundreds of thousands of Americans, uh, just from claims data, and showed that if you look at the people who are most likely to fill the prescriptions versus those who are least likely to fill their prescriptions, half of the cost associated with diabetes is accounted for uh, right there in that difference in adherence, a $4,800 per person per year difference associated with did you even go to the drugstore uh, and get your medicines. And, and the paper was so provocative that, and so many people disbelieved it, that he repeated the whole study with the California Public Employees data set and found exactly the same thing. So we're attacking that. In fact, this is the most commonly used medical app in the world today, uh, Walgreens uh, prescription refill app. Uh, and uh, there have been over 10 million downloads. And all of a sudden, they reduced half the barrier to getting your medication refilled, which is having to call the pharmacy and wait on hold and they, they hang up on you and you talk to somebody who doesn't speak English nearly as well as anybody in this room and, uh, and it's a nightmare and it's had a huge impact. Well, you know, tomorrow you're going to be able to check vital signs to be able to check all sorts of things about your health you know, just as easily as you can check your email today. Uh, and uh, anybody who hasn't looked at the X Prize competition for the tricorder uh, it, you really have to look at it. How many people in the room remember Star Trek and the Tricorder? Well, the hottest X Prize out there 
is for the person who can invent the tricorder and bring it to market. And you know it's going to happen because there's no X prize that's ever gone unawarded yet. So, you know, here's the, here's the first glimpse of the tricorder. Uh, how many people in the room have, you know, lived with a three-year-old? And you hear that, you know, loud cry of pain in the middle of the night that, you know, means, okay, we've got to go. And here you can just go downstairs to the nearest Maccabi all-night clinic. But for most Americans, it means going to a hospital emergency room. We don't have, we don't have Maccabi. We don't have anything like it. Well... They close at 11, okay. But the earache happens at 3 in the morning. And all of a sudden, here's a device that goes on an iPhone, looks at the ear, transmits it to the doctor, and the doctor calls the antibiotics over to the pharmacy. I mean, you know, how much, how much better could it get? Similarly, you know, thousands of Americans die of asthma on the way to the hospital because you don't know until the wheeze goes from subclinical to clinical that you're in trouble. And if you don't have the rescue meds, you're talking about a life-threatening condition. Uh, I have a 28-year-old you know, em employee, brilliant guy, MBA, he's walking around with a tracheostomy scar because somebody got him in time, but he's still got the tracheostomy scar. And you know, here's a little mHealth device where you hold it against your throat and it knows whether you're at risk or not. It knows whether you need to add that second medication the doctor gave you or add a second puff of the one that, uh, that he did give you. And here's, here's the corollary, which is a geolocating inhaler. It knows where you are when you use your rescue medicine and all of a sudden can start to point out areas that you might want to stay away from between uh, your home and your work or when you're out hiking. You know, everybody's seen this and, and, and nobody wants to have one. Well, all of a sudden this has turned into a Band-Aid. You know, all of a sudden you have the ability, you have heart monitors that go right on the back of an iPhone. Eric Topol likes to talk about the lives that he's saved on an airplane. I, I, I swear that he's paying people to get on the airplane to have the events so that he can hold it against his chest. Uh, but, you know, all of a sudden we, we've unlocked all sorts of opportunity. And I've been spending the last couple of years of my life on a, a company we founded where we focused on diabetes. Uh, because, you know, these are people who spend less than an hour a year with their doctor. I mean, those slides we saw this morning were just incredible. And they leave the encounter completely confused about what to do. They remember almost nothing that was said by the doctor. And then they have to spend the next 8,759 hours of the year trying to be their doctor. And the tasks that they're asked to undertake are you know, beyond comprehension for a lot of people. A lot of people have diabetes, didn't graduate from high school, much less from the technion. And the result is, is frustration, is futility, it's highly inconsistent adherence. And often they just give up and don't bother treating at all because they feel pretty well. Well, you know, all of a sudden we've got you know, a number of devices, ours is not the only one, where every time you test your blood sugar, the data goes right up to the cloud and you can get immediate feedback. And it's not about the device, it's about the effect you create by taking the patient out of the silo. That's the important thing to remember. It's not the technology, it's what you do with it. Because all of a sudden, you can get actionable guidance from your doctor, you can get actionable guidance from the care team, because it's not really the doctor you want to hear from. It's the nurse case manager, or it's the diabetes educator, you know, by and large, endocrinologists are good at making diagnoses and making big changes in care, but it's that nurse diabetes educator who's going to help you figure out how to balance the carbohydrates. The patient has ready access to the information on the internet. The mother of the kid with diabetes doesn't spend her day by the phone all day. She's no longer calling the school nurse to find out if her kid tested, if the kid's okay. Turns out in the United States, the child with diabetes is the one who's most likely to miss lunch because the child's required to line up at the nurse's office and show the nurse the glucose reading before the child's allowed to go to lunch. Well, I mean, yeah, if you ever heard of tip shoot, that's tip shoot. All of a sudden, we've got the information going by radio to the school nurse's computer. The kid goes straight to lunch, and now the kid doesn't have a late afternoon hypoglycemic attack. So, just with that little technologic change, 
you change the whole ecosystem of care. And that's what it's really about. It's empowering the care team so that rather than calling a thousand people with diabetes to identify the five people who are running low, the 10 people who are running high, and the 15 people who aren't testing at all, it's right there on your dashboard. You can drill down and spend the nurse time on those people. And we just finished a study at the largest HMO in the United States showing that with this technology, you cut the staff time in half. Well, when the fully burdened cost to the organization of a nurse hour is $150, cutting that staff time in half is probably the hugest gift you can give any healthcare provider organization. So the, the proof for this is now coming in. If you connect the doctor and the patient, if you can liberate the data from a dumb device up to the cloud and give the patient feedback, you double or triple adherence to testing depending on you know, how much support is added to it. On the low end, it's an insurance company that really added very little support. On the high end, it was a clinical research study with uh, study monitors who were determined to get maximum adherence who got better than 80% testing adherence. And if you talk to anybody in diabetes, that's just plain unheard of. Uh, I have a paper coming out in US Endocrinology next month showing an employer who saved $3,300 per diabetic employee per year on people using this system. And these were not the best and the brightest people. In fact, if you've ever been stopped for speeding in between New Orleans, Louisiana, and Houston, Texas, you've met one of these people. $3,300 per year savings just by putting a radio chip inside the glucose meter and adding a little bit of coaching over the telephone. And it's technology that patients and doctors like. There's an awful lot of technology that doctors don't like because it makes their lives more com complicated. And there's a lot of technology that patients don't like. But on poll after poll that we've done, people like this, people accept it. And it has a consistent and meaningful reduction on blood sugar and therefore a consistent and meaningful reduction on hemoglobin A1C, which for those of you who are not clinically oriented, is A, the gold standard of managing diabetes, but B, it's a fancy word for saying how much sugar is stuck to your red blood cells. And it's known from thousands of people of clinical trials that if you can reduce average sugar or hemoglobin A1C by 10%, you reduce the complications of diabetes by 37%. That's stroke, heart attack, blindness, and amputation by 37%. And if you look around, uh, somebody told me that the, uh, the English National Health Service is still doing 500 amputations a month. That's what diabetes really means if you don't control it properly. So the end of phase three of this you know, liberated devices is to make the encounter more interactive, to make healthcare you know, an anytime, anywhere experience, just like when you push that little red button in your new car and somebody says, you know, do you need help? We need to take health care to that. And we have a technology in front of us and that's stuff that you're seeing coming on the market and unfolding right as we speak. Because it works. You get higher satisfaction for the care team. You get cost savings for payers and employers. You get improved clinical results leading to fewer complications. You get anytime, anywhere care for the patient. And the thing that's driving it from an ecosystem perspective is that you get better quality performance ratings for the organization. And the coupon here are rated according to the same quality performance indications as the HMOs in the United States. In fact, a lot of the quality performance indications that you're reading about as part of the US Affordable Care Act were implemented as part of Israel's health reform circa 1992 and 1993. So we're finally catching up to the state of Israel from that perspective. Question is what's next? Because you know, I'm, I'm not here, I'm not talking at the medical school right now. I'm not talking to you know, a bunch of people who are immersed in the medical world. I'm talking at the Technion. So uh, you know, you're the guys who you know, invented the radio chips 
that you know, I finally got around to putting inside a glucose meter, but you know, to talk to you about packaging jobs, that's mostly not Technion kind of stuff. So what, to me, what, what is Technion kind of stuff? Well, let's, let's talk about the holy grail of diabetes. The JDRF, the Hemsley Foundation, everybody talks about the closed loop artificial pancreas. The notion that if you have a good enough way of measuring glucose, called a continuous glucose monitoring sensor, and a smart enough algorithm, uh, and a pump to deliver insulin, you'll be able to put the patient on autopilot. You'll have a closed loop pancreas. It's as if the pancreas cells never died in the first place. Well, anybody in the room see a movie called 2001, The Space Odyssey? You remember the scene where the computer kills the astronauts? Well, you know, every regulator who looks at a closed loop pancreas doesn't want to be the guy who approved the system that, that killed a bunch of people. And the truth is, there is no algorithm that's going to work right for all people. More importantly, the notion that an interstitial blood glucose monitoring sensor is going to do the job uh, is also ludicrous, partly because that sensor, because it's not sitting in an artery, it's sitting in the interstitial, in the, in the interstitial fluid is a fancy word for the fluid that's in between the cells of the body. Because the sensor is not sitting in the artery, it's sitting in the interstitial space, the, the glucose level in that interstitial space is always 45 minutes behind the glucose level in the artery. So you're already behind the time if that's what you're going to rely on. But more importantly, it turns out in the diabetes case that uh, unexpected exercise, unexpected physical activity is more likely to be associated with a disaster than, uh, unex than calculating your insulin bolus wrong. And calculating the carbohydrate bolus wrong is more likely to be associated with a disaster than measuring blood glucose incorrectly. So you need a multiplicity of sensors. And they probably include not only activity, they probably include galvanic skin conduction, heart rate. You're going to wind up with a sensor input that's got at least eight dimensions to it. And there may be somebody in this room who can solve a deterministic equation that has that many degrees of freedom. Uh, but I, you know, I barely made it through the second year of calculus. It isn't going to be me. Uh, so, you know, early on, the best you're going to do is have people in a call center monitoring a system like this and trying to keep it in balance. But my guess, and having listened to Shai this morning, is that there are people in this room who have the machine learning ability to say, well, okay, we only have eight sensors. We don't have 30. Eight sensors. That should be less than the six-month machine learning project. That should be a piece of cake for the people in this room. And that's really, to me, where the next frontier lies. I think that's, that's the real challenge when you talk about how do you bring together a faculty like this with a faculty of men. I have a minute and 52 seconds. I, could, I can teach Torah in that time. So that, that, that's the real opportunity in bringing a faculty like this together with a faculty of medicine is how do we marry M Health to machine learning? How do we take in that multiplicity of inputs that the human brain is really not very good at comprehending uh, and use what we've learned in machine learning to give that human brain the ability to implement the results of those inputs so that we look at a patient the patients had a genomic analysis on the way in the door, and all of a sudden, the computer comes back and says, well, wait a second, this person is going to have an increased sensitivity to warfarin, the most common blood thinner that's out there today. Uh, this person is going to have an increased risk of cardiomyopathy if you put them on statins. Uh, this person uh, is going to have a poor uh, glycemic response to metformin based on this, this, and this genetic sign put that together with the other multiplicity of sensors and feed the information to doctors in a way that they can make the proper executive decisions. Because that's what the human brain is good at doing. It's making that high level executive decision and it's very bad at processing large streams of data. So you know, it's not really about the big data. We're good at the big data. It's about the big imagination. It's about how do we put that machine learning expertise that this institution is famous for, together with 
the sensors, the stream of information that the medical world is now able to bring you, where you know, we can now give you a complete genomic sequence in a week, and two years from now, we'll give you a complete genomic sequence in an hour. So I'm thrilled to have been invited. I'm thrilled to have had a chance to, listening to listen to the other talks today, and I'll be thrilled to meet the rest of you at, at the remaining breaks. Thank you. Thank you.